So we're in 1 Samuel 21, where we are getting to God's faithfulness to David, even when David doesn't deserve it. Um, this is amazing passage in Lamentations that the, the mercies of the Lord are renewed each morning. And you know, one thing I was, when I was understanding that in Lamentations 3, the fact is it's not the mercy of the Lord are renewed because, you know, oh, God's kind to us today because we didn't mess up too bad. He's going to get us through next day. Like, no, that's after Israel has been totally destroyed because of their sin. And yet God is still merciful. And here in First Samuel 21, we see David do some things that he later comes to regret. And yet we see God continue to show his grace to David. So, as always, you've got to remember what just happened. You could jump back into the story. And last time we saw Jonathan's heroics, the fact that he was living as a one, as someone who was supposed to be the next king. He was the prince, ready to be the next king, and yet he gave it all up for the sake of his love towards his friend David, the man who loved the Lord he loved because he loved the Lord. And in the end, as they try and work out the little scheme to really discover what Saul thinks, they find out Saul will do anything to kill David, even throwing a spear at his own heir right? Like the one who he wants to be king, he's trying to kill because he's so mad at. And so David must go. But if you have your Bibles open, look back at 20, verse 22. Because you remember what Jonathan said to David, if I say to the youth, look, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for the Lord has sent you away. This thing, it's like, okay, if, this, if it comes to the case that Saul really is trying to kill you, yes, this is bad, but no, it is God who is trying to send you away. And as David is now on the run, basically for the rest of Saul's life, he sometimes makes some good decisions, sometimes makes some bad decisions. And in the midst of those, today we're going to see the two times that David's struggles reveal God's powerful grace in his life. Like David's going to go through some two intense struggles. He's going to make some bad decisions. Like I said, he'll later regret. And in the midst of it, he's going to see God's grace take care of him. So let's run through it together. You can follow along in your notes. Part one is David gives lame lies in Nob, but God provides for him. So David's going to give some lame lies but even though everyone probably knew what was going on, God still provides. And we're breaking this down, you can see, in two sections. We're going to talk about the event, what has happened in the passage, and then some commentary on that event found elsewhere in the Bible. Um, here in Jesus' commentary, and then the second part in David's own commentary. So, first off, verse 1 kicks off with David's fear-inducing arrival. Verse 1. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said, Why are you alone and no one with you? So David takes off from Gibeah. If you remember, it's over here in the central part of the hill country. And he goes south to Nob, this little town here. Nob is a small hillside city, just a little bit outside of Jerusalem. You can see how close it is to Jerusalem there. It's in the Mount of Olives in what is today known as Mount Scopus, we think. So it's within view shot of Jerusalem. And here he meets Ahimelech, the high priest. Now remember, even though, let's get a picture, ah, modern day Nob. Even though Nob is a place near Jerusalem, Jerusalem isn't important yet. It will be. But Nob right now is a place where the priests are all gathering. So Ahimelech here is the high priest, descendant of the high priest. Because if you recall, you remember back when Israel decided to um, use the Ark of the Covenant as a weapon instead of a worshipful tool. They use it as a, as a weapon rather than an act of worship towards God. They tried to force God to fight for them. And not only does the ark get taken, the entire town of Shiloh, where the 
tabernacle sat was wiped out by the Philistines. And then, if you recall, here's a little map just to remind you, the ark kind of bounced around from place to place, both as the Philistines tried to get rid of it, and then it ended up back in Israel's hand, and they tried to get rid of it. And so the ark is actually sitting over here in Kiriat Jerim on the left, and then Nob, where the tabernacle is set up, is over on the right, in, over the right in the right circle there. And you would think, why aren't they in the same place? Or maybe the priests are just hanging out, and we're not actually given a reason. Even here, we're not told in this passage that the tabernacle is even there, because the point is, the tabernacle is nothing without the ark. But Jesus says in Mark 2.26 that David entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence. So Jesus said he entered the house of God, which means the tabernacle was there. They had it set up, and the priests were trying to serve even though they were afraid of the Ark of the Covenant and left it far away. Now Ahimelech is the great-grandson of Eli. Remember Eli was killed because of the sins of his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, right when everything was destroyed. So here we have the grandson of Phineas, who is now serving as the priest. And David walks up to him and he trembles. Word means much afraid, panicked, to be shaking in your boots. Like you guys, have you ever thought about where, where something, like you, you, you were walking into a meeting with a boss or um, you get pulled over by a cop and the, and they steps up and you just can't stop shaking you're so nervous that's what he's experiencing right now and he doesn't doesn't tell us exactly why he's afraid except his question kind of hints at something right he said to him why are you alone and no one with you it's like why are you by yourself david where where's where's all your other people where are your soldiers what's going on and it, it seems like the same question, but it kind of makes sense. It's a little bit different because he's basically saying, you know, he was Paul's, or sorry, he was Saul's, messed that up every once in a while. He was Saul's armor bearer, and then he became one of the chief generals. So everywhere he went, he had either a kingly escort with him or he had his soldiers. Now David is alone. This seems kind of strange. And when a powerful warrior walks up to you all by himself, some concerns might be going through your head. Especially when he's the king's son-in-law. Like, does he come in here? Have I done something wrong? And perhaps, doesn't say, but perhaps he heard what happened at the end of chapter 19. Because word got around pretty quickly. Remember in chapter 19 at, at Naoth in Ramah? how the Spirit of the Lord came upon each wave of soldiers that Saul sent after David, and Saul himself stripped off his clothes, chapter 19, verse 24, and he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all day and all night. He was shouting out, David is king, David is king. And so people said, is Saul also among the prophets? Maybe he's a little concerned, like, okay, what's going to happen to me now if this happened to the king? We don't know. He just knows something's up. And so he asks, David, why are you here by yourself? And he's afraid. And David brings up a lie. Verses 2 through 3. David said to Ahimelech, the priest, the king has charged me with a matter and said to me, let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. And I have made an appointment with the young man for such and such a place. So he says, the king gave me super secret orders to go on a super secret mission. And I have some soldiers, but they're going to meet me in a place. So please, he says, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. He's like, I need sustenance. I'm traveling. Help me out. Again, this is all going to seem kind of fishy. 
And we know, though, at least he's telling the truth about the fact that he has other soldiers waiting for him. Because Jesus, again, when he talked about this in Mark 2, 26, he said, he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he also gave it to those who were with him. So Jesus says he's telling the truth here. There are some people with him. We just don't see them brought up. And, if you can go another way, the king did send him. Just not the king that we would think of or that Ahimelech is thinking of. The king, Yahweh, sent him, right? As as Jonathan had said, that Yahweh was sending him. Now he's like, the true king of Israel, the God is sending him. But this lack of clarity would kind of give the wrong impression. It's, it's like when someone asks you a question of saying, you know, did you, did you arrive on time? And you're like, well... I arrived right when I meant to. Wait, so did, did you arrive on time? Like, what? What did that mean? You know, he... Possibly, David had a very good motive. Like, he could have been worried, because here he is, he knows he's an enemy of the king, and what happened to Saul, or sorry, what happened to Jonathan when, when he challenged Saul? He threw a spear at him as his own son. So what's going to happen if, if Ahimelech helps him? So he might be protecting him, or he might be protecting himself and saying, if I reveal what's going on, the priest might turn me in because he still serves the king. Either way, the priest hears this and he gives compassionate and unlawful care. Compassionate and unlawful care is given. Compassionate, unlawful care. Verse 4 through 6. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread, if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, Truly, women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is in an ordinary journey. How much more today when the vessels be holy? So the priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread but the bread of the presence, which was removed from the before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. So the priest tells him, okay, you're asking for food. All I have is the holy bread. We don't have any normal bread on hand. This is, you know, this is a temple, not a kitchen. So why are you asking this? No, it, they must have run out of their normal provisions or something. And so he says, I have the holy bread, which is also called the bread of the presence. It comes from Exodus 25, verse 30, which says, you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me regularly. Here's a picture from a recreation in Israel of what that table and bread would look like. And these lay, these Loaves were put on a special table in a holy place, 12 of them, six on each side, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And the bread was constantly replaced with fresh bread. So they'd heat it up, they put it out there, it would sit for a day, maybe two, before the Lord as a sign of peace. And then when it was replaced, the priests would eat it. But since it was holy, only the priests were supposed to eat it. Leviticus 22, verse 10 says, A lay person shall not eat of a holy thing. And then Leviticus 22, 15 through 16 says, They shall not profane the holy things of the people of Israel, which they contribute to the Lord, and cause them to bear iniquity and guilt by eating their holy things. I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So he says both normal people don't get to eat this. If they do, they're going to bear guilt and sin. But Ahimelech is the high priest. Ahimelech gets to lead and decide and interpret God's law. And he knows David isn't just a king, isn't just a warrior. He knows David has Yahweh with him. And so he allows David to take of this holy food, but he gives one requirement, right? He gives one requirement and says that 
David and all his men must have kept from any sexual relations with their wives. Now, of course, this isn't to say that sex was bad or that Israelites thought it was negatively. In fact, the Bible rejoices in, the, in marriages one fleshing as the verb ends up being. But under the Levitical laws, having sex made you temporarily unclean, unable to do holy things. It was a sign what, out of many, many laws where you were supposed to not do something for a while to get ready for what was holy. This idea of something much like fasting. Fasting is good. We should still do it. But food is also really good. But the idea was is you deprived yourself of something for a little while to f- for focus on something even better. And it's interesting because he doesn't require total purity here. He could say, like, you know, the purity laws required not touching any dead people. But these are soldiers going into battle there's a pretty good chance they have or will come in contact with a dead person pretty soon. But he just focuses on one thing just to make sure they're focused. And so David's response then in verse 5 is, of course, he says, truly women have been kept from us as always. David always considered his mission or his men on their mission to be holy vessels. They had a job to do for God. They weren't just, all right, yeah, this is my normal day job. Like, like we get that. Like, our normal jobs, I just go and do my job, whatever. This isn't like a spiritual thing. We're not having a festival, you know, whatever. I'm not being a pastor. I'm not serving in the church. This is just a normal job. But to David, every moment... Every act of service, when they went out into battle, they were serving God, and so they had to treat it just as if they were going to a holy festival or celebration. And this ends up being kind of ironic, though. Because you remember the whole problem with David and Bathsheba? A book later, when he is sitting on his throne, and he sees the wife of Uriah, and he calls to her, and he commits adultery with her, and she's pregnant, and he wants to cover it up. And so he calls Uriah back from the battlefield, Uriah the Hittite. He gets him drunk, and he sends him to his wife, and Uriah still follows David's example. The example that David set all these years before, that his fellow soldiers were on holy mission. And so he, according to 2 Samuel 11, 11, would not go into his wife because he was still on holy mission. And of course, that ends badly for David as David goes to the only thing he can do, getting the man killed, and is rebuked for it, and thankfully repents later on. But it is it interesting how the very pattern that David set up is followed, even to David's own hurt. The priests, knowing that they are holy men, gives them the bread and says, go and take it. And the narrator interrupts this with the ominous interjection. In verse 7, we have the dangerous servant observing. Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. When you see a word like that, like look in your Bible, it starts off with verse 7, now. That's like, stop, and you're like, okay, why is that there? Especially because the next phrase is actually verse 8, then David said. So they've had this back and forth. David says, Ahimelech says. And David says, Ahimelech says. And then verse 7, it just stops and focuses on this random guy who's standing there for a reason, foreshadowing. Now, Doeg was a, an Edomite, so a descendant of Esau, from the neighboring country of Edom, which had long been enemies of Israel. Oh, Israel's over on the left, Edom's down the the lower right, and so they're constantly fighting for territory. They went all the way back from when this is from, when they were actually coming out of the Exodus, and they were trying to pass through Edom, and the Edomites didn't want them to do it, so they fought. Long history. Perhaps Doeg is a um, captured slave and is serving Saul, 
Or maybe he's just a normal servant who's a proselyte to Israel and wants to serve the Israelite king. But he was the chief herdsman of the king. And he's there because he had he made some oath or perhaps he had some requirement put upon him that he stuck at the tabernacle for a while. And this comes up because not only do we, the audience, have our attention drawn to Doeg, David noticed Doeg. Turn to 1 Samuel 22, verse 22, because we're going to sadly see that Doeg takes this news and like... You know, I, I hate this, but it's like a little sister seeing her big brother. I had a little sister. She didn't do this to me all that time, but I'll, I'll still use it. It's like a little sister seeing her big brother do something wrong. And it's like, ha And And so Doeg sees the favored son, the great warrior David, and he runs to Saul and he tells him. And Saul takes soldiers to Nob and they kill all the priests there, except they refuse to, but it's Doeg who does and is willing to kill them. And David says in chapter 22, verse 22, to Abathar, the priest, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all these persons of your father's house. David realizes that he saw this man and he did nothing. And his lies, rather than protecting the priests, actually maybe put them in more danger because they're not prepared for Saul. The priest continues on. No matter what David thought about lying to them, it, it doesn't protect them. But he continues lying anyways. And his lies really start to get unbelievable because David then requests armaments in haste because of his haste. So he requests armaments because of his haste. It's like, I need need weapons. Verse 8 and 9. He said, Then David said to Elhimelech, Then have you not a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Allah, behold, it is wrapped up in cloth behind the ephod. And and if you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. David asked for a weapon because basically says, my time was short. I didn't have time to grab any armaments. Do you have anything that I could use? But This seems kind of weird because look back at verse 5 is he said that women have been kept from us as always because the vessels of the young men are holy even when it's an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So do you get what he's saying there? He's saying we had a very special mission. So because it was a special mission, we, we were training hard, we were focused, and so we kept ourselves pure. But wait a second, David. How could you be in so much haste that you forgot your weapons and you also had time for your soldiers to properly prepare for a special holy task? Huh. Most commentators at this point will even say that here the priest was naive or he was just going along with David. You know that where like you know it's a lie? It's a lie from someone you love and respect and you know they're not telling you the truth, but you're going to be like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go for you anyways. Or, or you just would never expect them to lie. Like you would never expect it and so you refuse to believe it. So instead he points out and says, ah, the sword of Goliath is behind the ephod over there. Remember the ephod was ceremonial dress used by the priests to determine the will of God. And David then is given the weapon of his victory. We have a lovely artistic rendition here of our resident artist, Richard. Thank you for drawing that out. I know, isn't that nice? And he's given the sword of Goliath, which is some artistic interpretation. 
And notice, look, look at like David's response. I love, I love what you did with this too. He's looking at it and he's basically imagining him saying, there is none like it. Give it to me. And while, yes, this is probably a very impressive sword, that might not be the best decision to make for David. Pastor Richard Phillips writing on this says, it says much that the same David who refused to wear the armor of Israel's king when he was filled with the spirit for his battle with Goliath now rejoices to wield the weapon of his former pagan enemy. No longer relying on God's strength, he exulted in the sword itself, saying, there is none like it. At Nob, David sought to protect himself with a lie, and he permitted his behavior to endanger others and exulted in the worldly weapons he acquired. But Jesus' commentary on this passage makes it even more interesting. Hold your finger here. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Again, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you hear stuff on the news and you're like, okay, do I believe this? Do I, do, do I not? Like, whatever. But then, like, if you're like, some, someone's like, no, it was an eyewitness. I, I can give you a personal account. So, you know, sadly, you remember that there was that shooting um, a few years ago. Uh, well, uh, this, sorry, there's been numerous shootings. Um, now I'm just blanking on it. This, this, the school, the elementary school shooting. Um, Park, no, not Parkside. Uh, Sandy Oak. Sandy Oak. Because it's one thing to hear about that, right? And you're like, uh, and then of course there's always some lunatics who are like, oh, the whole thing was faked. But I, I one of uh, a fellow master seminary grad is in that town, and he went to the school, and to hear him describe it in the sorrow and the pain, you're like, oh no, that thing was real. Jesus is like that because Jesus being God has seen it all. And so when he refers to something in the Old Testament, we have to stop and listen. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this all comes up because there's a problem with the Sabbath. At the time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But the Pharisees saw it. They said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. The disciples are walking along. They're hungry. So they see some grain hanging in the field. They grab it. They break it apart. They eat it. And the edges of fields in Israel by the commands of the law were not harvested. So there was always um, wheat sticking up in them. So you could just walk along and grab it. The poor, the foreign, the orphaners were commanded by Leviticus 19 to always have something available to them. And the disciples left everything and were pretty poor, but they were also traveling. So rabbinic law said those traveling could just grab food when they needed it. But it was the Sabbath. And there was this rabbinic law that said you could pluck, but you could not rub. And so here they were doing it. The Pharisees see Jesus and they're like, aha, you are letting your disciples get away with this. What's wrong with you? Jesus is wise, though, because he doesn't get into the battle of interpreting, oh, whether the law actually forbids this or not. Like he doesn't want to put up his, uh, his fists and go uh, punch by punch with them. He gets to the heart of the issue. He knocks them flat down on their face and points back to the example of David. He says, Have you not read? Kind of an insult there. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? So he points back to David and says, David was allowed to eat what only the priests could. David was allowed to do what was not lawful. And he's like, and also, have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? 
It's like the priests work on the Sabbath. The priests are getting around and doing their job when we're supposed to be resting and doing nothing. It's like, wait a second. He's pointing out that built into the law were exceptions to the law. For example, we don't have to turn there for the sake of time, but in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 12 through 20, we see that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, they offer an unauthorized incense and they are burned up, right? And so Aaron goes ahead and offers the sin offering and he's supposed to, not after he gives offering, eat the rest of it that very day. And he doesn't. And Moses comes in and says, how dare you not eat this? And Aaron says, Moses, would the Lord be proud? It seems presumptuous. It's, he's implicating to eat on this day. It seems presumptuous to celebrate because eating is supposed to be celebratory on a day where our priests were just killed for their sin. And the passage in verse 20 ends with, Moses approves. So interesting, shortly after saying that the priest must always eat it that day, we see Moses approving of an exception. Because here, in not here, but in the passage that's mentioned in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He breaks apart and says, these laws were meant to help you not to hurt you. And so Jesus says here in verse 6, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of the Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus says God wants mercy not sacrifice. He wants care for sinners, not focus on rituals. And the disciples were innocent men. He says they would not have condemned the guiltless. The disciples had done nothing wrong. They're not pawns to be used in a battle against Jesus. But he finishes it by pointing him back to himself, that the presence of one greater than the temple or greater than David is here. See, Notice he says that the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Why could Jesus decide what was right or wrong understanding of the law? Why could he say what was right to do and wrong to do on the Sabbath? Because he was the promised Son of Man who Daniel pointed to to being like God. He is the descendant of David. He is the Messiah. And if regulations to protect what was holy could be set aside for the great David and those with him, how much more the Messiah? See, think of it this way. David was desperate and he asked for something he should not have received, but he got it because of the grace of God. The Lord provides mercy to help innocent David, right? You know, it's, it's kind of like the strict no Sunday laws for Chick-fil-A, right? I mean, how many Sundays? I, I, I have driven by and we're like, you know, we should stop for Chick-fil-A and grab something really quickly, either before mor- after morning service or after evening service. It's like, like, oh yeah, I just could really go for like a peach milkshake right now. Delicious treats. And you drive by and you're like, oh wait, it's Sunday. They're closed. As they are every Sunday, And yet, in September of 2018, Hurricane Florence hit the East Coast. And in Williamton, North Carolina, Chick-fil-A opened its doors on a Sunday. And they offered free meals to first responders and all the locals after the hurricane had left thousands of people displaced, their homes destroyed, right? Now, you by this way, did they really break the rule? Not really, because they weren't really open. It wasn't a normal day. But they opened their doors wide 
to provide mercy and help to those in need. And so we too need to have a right understanding of the law, that the law, though present, is designed to help us grant mercy. So Jesus teaches us not to be legalistic in a bad sense, okay? Because on one sense, we can't despise the law. Jesus said, I have not come to overthrow the law, but to fulfill it. And so there's this phrase, antinomian, which means against nomian law. And it's like, eh, I, I don't care. I don't care what the law says. But the law, even Paul brings out, is to, meant to make us dependent upon God. Because he says in Romans 3, verse 20, for through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law teaches you what is wrong. Seeing a sign that says, keep off the grass, teaches you to keep off the grass. But the problem is, if you put a keep off the grass sign in front of a bunch of kids, the first thing that they're going to do is run out onto the grass and touch the sign. But Jesus knows we as Christians in the new covenant are not bound by the 613 commands in the Mosaic law. We are not bound by the Ten Commandments because Romans 6 verse 14 says, sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but you are under grace. You're not under the law. You're not under the Ten Commandments, but we have a different law. We do have a law. We have a law of Christ. Galatians 6 verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, what Jesus is saying is that, you know, you're not supposed to worry about, okay, what are the rules and restrictions? What are the do's and do nots? He's saying, you need to see each other's burdens and to pick up each other up and help each other follow what I say. Theologian Charles Ryrie said, the law of Christ has all the hundreds of commandments of the New Testament epistles all put together to form this new, distinct code. So this doesn't mean we ignore sin. We don't ignore the commands of saying what to do and do not. We cannot. But this does mean we can forgive the person who sins and breaks the law over and over again as we allow God to work in them. You think of it this way, we still condemn the guilty, but we always provide the path of forgiveness. When someone stumbles in their sin, we who are spiritual come alongside to restore them. We're not bound by the Old Testament law, but we have far harder laws to bear. Laws of caring. Now, David doesn't seem to learn the lesson of God's provision here because he's still fearful. As secondly, David foolishly fears man in Gath, but God protects him. Verses 10 through 15. In verse 10 through 11, David flees, but God, but is still remembered. So, Verse 10, David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands? Now, if you follow the red line, David takes off from Nob, crosses over of, out of Israel into Philistine territory into the important city of Gath, which also happens to be the hometown of Goliath. And he walks into the hometown of Goliath bearing the large sword of hometown boy who he killed. Yeah. Perhaps he thought he could get mercenary work with with Achish, kind of assuming, okay, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. He's like, let's, let's work together. But the servants quickly recognize David and go, wait a second, this guy has killed tens of thousands of Philistines. 
The servants did not see him as a welcome defector. They saw him as a threat. And so David pretends. He is afraid, and so he pretends. Verse 11 through 13. David took these words to heart, verse 12, and was much afraid of, of, of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before him and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Again, just like when David showed up to Jonathan, he's very fearful. He's concerned. The man who stood up to a giant on single-handed combat is now terrified, thinking God has abandoned him. And haven't we all been there? <laughs> You've experienced one more bad thing after another, where you're like, really, God? Really, again? Why is this happening again? It, there, there does not seem to be light at the end of this tunnel. Have you abandoned me? And David's response is, I'm going to pretend to be crazy. And so he goes to the main city gates and he scribbles on them graffiti, crazy things. He lets saliva run down his beard, which we have some very manly beards represented here tonight. Thank you guys for showing them off. But you got to remember, like back then, it wasn't, the beard wasn't just a fashion choice. Like, it was, it was an immense personal pride issue. Enough that when the Ammonites take King David's messengers and they shave off half their beards, they're mourning in tears. And David tells them, all right, dudes, okay, this is horrible. Go and wait until your beard grows back. And he gathers his forces to go and kill the people who cut off the beards. Like, this is a serious issue for them. It was a big sign of honor. And so if you desecrated your own beard by allowing saliva to go through it, like you've, you've come to the end of yourself. Like everyone looked at him and was like, wow, what's, what's wrong with him? That would be like... I, I can't think of something quite as, as things, but it would be like walking around with large holes in your pants, just showing off your undergarments. And people would just be like, are you okay? Like, what's wrong with you? And so David is brought to Achish, but he's ignored. The king says in verse 14, behold, You see, this man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Verse chapter 22, verse 1. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So David is able to leave there without any confrontation and takes off to his next destination, which we'll hear about next week. But this isn't the end of David's reflection on this event. David provides us commentary on what he thinks about this. He doesn't just go, wow, I was lucky. I can't believe that worked. Like, I put on the most ridiculous disguise. You know, like those people who put on, you know, glasses with the little puffy nose and the fake mustache? And it's like, uh, it's still you, I can totally tell. So David's not like, man, I put on this fake act and it totally worked. No, he understands that it was Yahweh who rescued him. We have two Psalms. Psalm 56, which has the title, A Mictam of David when the Philistines seized him in Gath. That's the Psalm reflecting on when he was captured. And Psalm 34 when David got away, as it says, the title is of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. Now, we won't take the time to read through these two hymns tonight because we're running out of time. But let me just point out some lessons he learns from those and maybe we can look at them a little bit more later. But the first lesson he learned is that his fear was misplaced. In Psalm 56, 
verse 3 through 4, he says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? In the middle of the incident, he is afraid of the king and his servants. But now, reflecting on it, he goes, What can man do to me? I need to fear the Lord. Secondly, he learned God provides for his people in all their needs. Psalm 56, verse 13 He says, For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. God, you rescued me so that I might serve you. Or Psalm 34, 9 through 10, he wrote, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. I've always heard that that quote, those, you know, the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who trust the Lord lack no good thing. And you realize, wait a second, he learned this lesson when he was terrified and trying to act crazy. Ralph Davis, the commentator, writes on this, says, In the midst of the confusion and danger and fear, David received his daily bread. David was cared for. Third, David learned that God protects his people in danger. It's his main point. As he said in Psalm 34, verses 6 through 8, the poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. It's the need for refuge that shows David the Lord is good. Sometimes we, we want, we're like, no, God, I want you to show me you are good by making me never have to need you. Like, if my life is comfortable and good and I have no problems, then you're good, right? But David shows us it's when we are in need. It's when you look and you say, I got nothing, that God shows himself to taste good. It's when you have no other food, you are hungry and desperate, that food tastes the sweetest. Fourth, say God trains his children. It seems that Yahweh arranged these very experiences to teach David his need for, or teach David his weakness and his need for grace. Because David was completely successful up to this point, and suddenly he is now struggling. And so in Psalm 34, verse 4, David says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. God arranged it so that he would seek the Lord and the Lord would deliver him. And then fifth, God has pity towards those who belong to him. Psalm 34, 17 through 18, when the righteous cry for help, The Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. David's lies and secrecy do not save him. His prayers did. You get that? Like sometimes we do have to work. We have to do our activities. We have to work hard trying to pay the rent, trying to engage in the right activities, trying to love our families, love our neighbors, endure when we are attacked. And we do these things, but we know none of those things are what save us. It is, in fact, our prayers in the midst of that. 
God has pity to those who belong to him. See, David actually had a failure of faith in verses, in verses 10 through 15 of First Samuel verse 20. He was afraid. And the Psalms show us he later looks back on those and says, what did I have to fear? I had God with me. So we should not fear man, but trust in God's kind protection because he can protect us even when it makes no sense. God helped David even when he lied and God helped David when he was afraid. And God used again these bad experiences to show his power and his grace. Pray with me. Oh Lord, We thank you that you hear us, that you are there when we call. We thank you for Jesus, that Jesus is the greater David, that he gives us mercy and care when we need it. And so, Lord, we ask that you would enable us not to be legalistic towards others or towards ourselves, but may we seek to follow you. May we seek to bear one another up, knowing that you bear up us up. And may we be like David and learn from our mistakes that the fear doesn't profit anything, but we can trust in you. Use your truth, even tonight, to remind us of these things. May We walk in faith, trusting your good name. For the praise of who you are, O great God. Amen. God. Amen. God. Amen. God. Amen. God. Amen. God. Amen.